But let me help you understand something even to a greater degree. The Holy Spirit's right there and 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 all right there, 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 there. That's where the Holy Spirit is. Oh, come on. I am praying for Pentecost. I'm ready for Pentecost Sunday next Sunday. I'm ready for it, but I'm telling you, I'm ready for Pentecost Monday and Pentecost Tuesday and Pentecost Wednesday and Pentecost Thursday. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, but that maybe God would wake us up in the middle of the night, and I know most of your ages, and y'all are there anyway. You wake up about 3 o'clock like clockwork every night anyway. What would happen if the Holy Spirit just got hold of us and said, why don't you come into the living room? Can I tell you, God, it might just have cause us to have a runaway. We might as well turn on the coffee pots and turn on the lights. And energy's going to wonder what's going on in Poland. We've had an energy spike out there. People are awake. Why? Because God is awake. And God's moving. I don't know about you, but I'd like that. I'd like that. Because I don't want, listen, I have lived in religiosity, I have lived in stagnant, impotent religion. I have lived to where we just came to church and that was all there was. But I value, come on, I value the moving of the Holy Spirit. I value something. Hey, I don't. I know I don't have to touch God. I don't have to hear God. I don't have the have these tangible things. I walk by faith, not by sight. But I'm glad I live for God, who shows up, and He wants to be felt, and He desires to be heard, and He wants to be seen. Hmm. Hmm. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. I want you to pray with me this week. Actually, tomorrow. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Um, every other month, I'm driving down to Dallas for a couple days because I need to be a better pastor. I need to, I need more. I can't give you what I don't have. And I'm meeting with a group. We're in a covenant right now for a year. Every other month we meet together, 24 pastors from about 13 different states. We all meet together and we seek the face of God. And we are tearing up the word of God. And we are getting to know who we are and how God has fashioned us and what God is up to specifically regarding rural churches. Every single one of us come from communities of 10,000 or less, uh, even 5,000 or less. If you're like Poen, <laughs> you, you, you can't even look at 1,000. I mean, we're nowhere near that. But there's so many of us that are like that because I'm telling you where the grass roots, where the rubber hits the road of, of Christianity in America is right here. It's in places like this. It's not Little Rock. It's not Memphis. It's not Austin. It's not Tallahassee. It's the small rural areas like this. And uh, uh, I was just in, a, in district council uh, with all the Assemblies of God churches in the state of Arkansas. We were in Hot Springs. And they said that uh, um, where the Holy Spirit is moving the most, matter of fact, if, if, if you want to see the Holy Spirit move, you better go to a rural church of under 100. Think about that. A rural church of under 100, you're going to be more prone to see the Holy Spirit move, get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and even called to the ministry. And most of us look at rural churches of under 100 as <laughs> that's where you go when there's nowhere else to go. Come on. Have you know God values Poe in Arkansas? Nobody else may value Poe in Arkansas. God does. God values where you live. God values who you are and what you do. And I want you to pray with me because as pastors, we're getting together and we're actually seeing some things. Uh, um, um, there's a national spark being created out of our little group 
the Vital magazine. There's some of them. I just put some more back out on the front table. Uh, they're actually going to be there tomorrow taking pictures because Springfield has heard about the Water Tower Network. They've heard about this group of rural pastors that are getting together just because they want to see the grassroots catch on fire again. So I'm asking to pray with us, church. Pray with us. Pray for me because I, I want more. I just, I want more of God. Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal. This is the last in this, <clears throat> in this study. It could be called the Feast of the Father, but I like to refer to it this way, and you'll see it in just a moment. And it's simply the term, we had to celebrate. We had to celebrate. It's not a choice. It's not an option. We had to celebrate. Look with me in Luke chapter 15. Starting in verse number 11. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, all of his together, and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Wasteful, extravagant living. But when he had spent all there, uh, all he had, there arose a severe famine in that land and he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country who sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything. And when he had come to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and earth before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Have you ever felt that way before? Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this son, was, this son of mine was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. And now his older son was in the field. And when he came and drew near to the house. And he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry. And he would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. And so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time, yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours <clears throat> came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, who killed the, you have killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It is right that we should make merry, or we had to celebrate. And be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. We have looked at the story of the younger brother. I cannot tell you enough, and I hope this book has meant something to you. This is a life changer for me. I love what I see in the prodigal God. I don't always like what I hear. Have you understand that? I don't like recognizing myself as the elder brother. I don't like seeing my faults and failures. I don't like having to look at myself in the mirror spiritually and realize I fall short. I love this book. I love what it's shown me. I love how it's helping us to reclaim what the heart of the gospel was all about. To seek and save that which was lost, beginning where? With me. Beginning with me. We've seen the story of the younger brother. We put it into context with the story of the older brother. We put the two brothers together to see how they mix with each other. Uh, and each time we saw another part of Jesus' message. 
But we're not quite done. There's one thing left, and we need to see the story in the context of the whole Bible. Jesus was immersed with the Scriptures, constantly quoting the Scriptures. And this story he is giving us is, in essence, the whole Bible storyline. It's a very vivid, one vivid narrative of the Bible, of what God came to do. And if we see that, we're going to get a bird's eye view of the whole of what God's trying to do. And again, three things we want to learn. Number one, the human condition, the divine solution, and the new communion. The human condition, the divine solution, and then the new communion. First of all, in verses 13 through 17, let's look at the human condition. Verses 13 through 17 right there talks about how the son fell short and how he went off. The younger son's Sin turned him into an exile from his own home. He disgraced his family, disgraced his community. It would be right, we studied about this, it would be right for the father to have taken him and killed him with just the very fact that he said, Dad, I want my part of your stuff. What he was literally saying is, I wish you were dead so I could get my inheritance, so I get my hands on what is mine. And according to Old Testament law, Again, when you hear Jesus, he's not quoting the New Testament. He is the New Testament. What he is quoting is the Old Testament and the law. Therefore, we need to be an Old Testament people. Don't throw it away. But it, we realize that the Old Testament says you have every right to take that young man outside the gates of the city and kill him. Why? Because he's rebellious. He deserved to die. He deserved to be excommunicated. He deserved to have everybody mad at him. And he would have had to take his money and go far away because if he stayed in the area, people would have been after him. People would have attacked him. People would have uh, uh, treated him wrong. And when he did so, he became a very image of the human race. He became an image of you and I. For we were made for life in the Garden of Eden. That's where we were supposed to be. But because of sin, we were cast out from it. We lost our homes. We are exiles. And I want you to see this. We are not living where we were meant to live. You were not meant to live in Poen or Malvern or wherever. You were meant to live in a place called Eden. Think about that. You were meant to be, Keith, naked. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We are meant to be in Eden. Think about that. We are meant to live in this place that is perfect, this place that is holy, this place that is pure, this place that is wonderful. We were meant to live there. Where do we live? We live in an area that was purchased through the Swamp Reclamation Act of 1850. They got property, drained the swamp, ran the alligators out, and didn't get rid of the mosquitoes. I don't think there was any mosquitoes in the Garden of Eden, just saying. We're exiles, home. And I want you to catch this because this is a concept that you need to see for tonight through this whole thing is the word home. Somebody say the word home. I don't know what home means to you. I know what home means to me, having my parents and my sister here. I know what home means to me. Home, home to me is Florence, Texas, Colleen, Texas, right there where, where I grew up. Home for my kids, being in the ministry, is <laughs> wherever mom and dad are. <laughs> That's about it. Home is a place that truly fits you. It's the place that suits you. That may be a different thing for different people. Home is not necessarily where you're at now. There may be a place that you have lived before that you long to go back to. You long to go back to that place. How do you know there are people who long to come back to central Arkansas just as there's people trying to get out of central Arkansas somewhere else? Home is what suits you. Home is what fits you. And we were made to know and serve God and to live in his presence, enjoying his love and beauty. And where that is is spiritually home. That's where God has called us to be. 
And however, because we wanted to be our own lords and saviors, just like the sons that you see in the story, because we wanted to be our own lords and saviors, we lost God and therefore we wander around in a world and we experience this thing that the philosopher Heidegger called. He said this. It's a German word, and I'm going to just butcher it right here. Unheimlichet. Kind of like Heimlich maneuver, but it's not quite that. Unheimlichet. I don't know if any of you are fluent in German. Anybody? Great. I'm a scholar. You have to believe what I say. Unheimlichet. The word, however you pronounce it, translates to this. An eeriness or an uncanniness, but literally meaning also away from home. Uh, an eeriness away from home. Uh, literally, Heidegger's word uh, refers to an anxiety or a spiritual nausea, a spiritual nausea that comes from never feeling at home in this world. C.S. Lewis once said, when the things of this world do not satisfy, it's a longer quote than that, but I'll paraphrase it. When the things of this world do not satisfy, it means that I was destined for another world. Israel. When I went to Israel in, uh, I believe it was 2009, never been there before, never been on that side of the world before, had been to Australia one time, but that's nowhere near Israel. Had never been to that part of the world before. And when I flew over there with a group of people from here in Arkansas, we were going on a tour, and uh, when we touched down in Tel Aviv, it's about 2 in the morning, it's dark out there. All you had was like these street lamps along the street. They had that orange glow like some street lamps do. And I got out there, and it's dusty. You can see some old palm trees. I mean, you're in the middle of a desert. And for some reason, when I stepped off that plane onto that ground, something clicked in me. I felt like I was home. And as I toured around Israel, didn't matter where I went, up by the Sea of Galilee, down to the, uh, uh, the Dead Sea, uh, over into Jerusalem, uh, uh, man, you get to see it. It's, it's not that big. You could put five Israels in the state of Arkansas. It's not that big. And as I toured around that area, it didn't matter where I went. I'd never seen that before, never seen animals like that before, never seen vegetation like that before, never been around that kind of people, yet I felt like I was home. And when I left Israel and came back, I got a buddy of mine from, from uh, Australia, Carl, is in, is, he's there right now, and, I, and I've tried to tell him, when you get home, you're going to be in trouble. When I came back to Arkansas, touched down at, at Hillbilly Airport, some of y'all get that, <laughs> touched down at the airport and went home, I was lost for about, it was weeks, because I didn't recognize where I was at. Sure, I'd spent years at that place, in that home, ministering in that church, taking my kids to that school, but it didn't feel right because home was over there. And to come back to Arkansas, which is a beautiful place. I love having four seasons. Everything's green. I like it. I didn't feel like I was high. Matter of fact, I felt like I had been hauled away against my will. From my home. Look with me if you have your books. Page 103. Page 103 at the top of the page says this. Timothy Keller says, Home then is a powerful but elusive concept. The strong feelings that surround it reveal some deep longing within us for a place that absolutely fits and suits us where we can be or perhaps find our true selves. Yet it seems that no real place or actual family ever satisfies those yearnings, though many situations arouse them. In his novel, A Separate Peace, John Knowles' central character discovers the, that summer mornings in New Hampshire gave him, quote, some feeling so hopelessly promising 
that I would fall back in my bed to guard against it. I wanted to break out crying from stabs of hopeless joy or intolerable promise or because those mornings were too full of beauty for me. In East of Eden, John Steinbeck similarly says of the mountains of Central California that he wanted, quote, to climb into their warm foothills almost as you want to climb into the lap of a beloved mother. The memory of home seems to be powerfully evoked by certain sights, sounds, and even smells, but they can only arouse a desire that they can't fulfill. Many of the people in my church have shared with me how disappointing Christmas and Thanksgiving can be to them. They prepare for holidays hoping that finally this year the gathering of the family at that important place will deliver the experience of warmth, joy, comfort, and love that they want from it. But these events almost always fail, crushed under the weight of impossible expectations. That German word that gets us at this concept, the word sensucht, the dictionaries will tell you that there's no simple English synonym for it. It denotes profound homesickness or longing, but with a transcendent overtone. The writer who spoke of this spiritual homesickness was C.S. Lewis. In his famous sermon, The Weight of Glory, he refers to many similar experiences as those described by Steinbeck and Knowles. And then he says, Our, commonest, uh, our most commonest expedient is to call it beauty and behave, behave as if it had settled the matter. Wordsworth expedient was to identify with certain moments in his own past, but all this is a cheat. If Wordsworth can go back to those moments in the past, he would not have found the thing himself, but only the reminder of it. What he remembered would turn out to be itself a remembering. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. These things, the beauty, the memory of his, our own past, are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the one thing, that, uh, if, they mistake, if it's mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking their hearts, of their worshipers, for they are not the thing itself. Now we wake to find we have been mere spectators. Beauty has smiled, but not to welcome us. Her face has turned our direction, but not to see us. We have not been accepted, welcomed, or taken in. Our lifelong nostalgia, our longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we feel cut off, to be on the inside of some door which we have always seen from the outside, is no more neurotic fancy than the truest index of our real situation. When the younger brother came to his senses, he was in this place of foreignness. And again, this is written from a Jewish perspective. He is amongst an unclean situation, a situation that no good Jewish boy would ever find himself and it says at that moment, he came to his senses. He realized there's home. There's something better. He realized that he needed to go home, but how? How is he going to go home? He realized he was an outcast, so why would they receive him? And yet still, he went home. And you will learn that the older brother was guilty of the same sins. Now, let's shift gears here. I want to talk about the divine solution. In verses 31 through 32, there in chapter 15, it talks about the feast. It talks about what the Father was doing to celebrate. The centerpiece of the whole parable is the feast. That's why we talk about sitting down at the table. If you remember the very first one we did, we had a table here and a table there. A table for those that we would not normally welcome into the church, while there was a table over here of the good church people. Everybody will sit down at the feast, at a feast. The father throws a feast filled with music and dancing, great delicacies, and it's to mark a reconciliation. It's to mark the restoration of his son, that his younger son came home. And he said in verse 32, we had to celebrate. There was no choice. You have to ask yourself, why is the feast so important? 
When the prodigal comes home, when the one that was in wayward living and wasteful spending, when he finally comes home, why would you need to celebrate? If anything, he needs to be whooped. Why would you celebrate him coming home? In the Old Testament, and again, you have to look at this from their perspective. Jesus was speaking from his perspective. In the Old Testament, the meals ratified covenants. You celebrated victories. If something good happened, let's have a meal. If we signed a document, we're going to have a meal. There's a lot of times if there was transactions of a great nature, there was a meal to commemorate that thing. And so uh, whenever something good happened, you marked all your special family occasions and transitions, such as births and weddings and funerals and all those things, you celebrate it with a meal. And a feast was established to mark probably the greatest event in the salvation history of God's people at that time, and that was the Passover. The Passover that celebrates we have a place to go to be with God. There's a whole meal that goes with that. And it's important because in the ancient times, meals were prolonged affairs that usually lasted all evening, usually until bedtime, since there was little else to do, especially after a strenuous day. Uh, there's not much else to do. You sit at the table. What happens when Thanksgiving comes around and let's say you have Thanksgiving lunch? What do you do the rest of the day? You eat. You may be done, but you still eat. You put up what needs to be put up, but you still got leftover turkey carcass sit, sitting up there on the, on the stove. You still got some, some sweet potatoes or, or some dressing, and some of y'all are getting hungry right now. You got, you got the pecan pies and all that stuff sitting out there. And so from time to time, you know, you've had it, family get-togethers. What do you do? You just keep eating. You eat all day long. Do I need to eat? No, but it sure is good. And that's what they did. To the Jew, that's what they did, especially on a great occasion when you had something take place. My son graduates from high school. What do we do? We have a feast, and we feast the whole time. There's food everywhere, and you just keep eating, and you just keep eating. This was a way of life for them. And so when they all came together for the evening meal, the evening meals, more so than any other, breakfast, I got to hurry up because I got to go work. Lunch, I might eat something while I'm out there in the field. But supper was when you've cleaned up, everybody's together. All the kids, all the parents, all the adults. It was not uncommon to have multiple generations under one roof. And so at that moment, the, the, when the women cooked, they focused on one meal, and that was supper. And so they would all come together at the evening meal and they would sit together. You got nowhere else to go. You don't have to work. You don't have to do anything else. And so they made supper a place that, that evening meal was the center of family life, both in symbol and in practice. Where does a family come together at any given moment? At the dinner table, at night. That's where they came together. There was a, it was a place of intimacy. And, uh, and we don't have to be people of the first century to grasp that. We get that. We get that understanding. Breakfast, man, my kids are grabbing it as they're running out the door, chomping on a Pop-Tart while they're hopping in a car with Pop-Tart in one hand, shoe in the other, and trying to, trying to get to school on time. They're running out that way. Me and Mama, we're sitting on the couch drinking coffee saying, free at last, free at last. <laughs> Lunch, kids are at school. They're eating school food. They're texting us saying, can you come bring me something? I don't like what they're serving today. <laughs> Two words. Too bad. <laughs> Eat it. But what do we do at supper time? We all get together. Now, if you're in the Sullivan household, it may not be around the dinner table. It may be on TV trays in the living room. But guess what we're doing? We're all there together. It's all a family thing. You get it. I get it. We do that as family. We, we'll get together and do these things. And there's a, there's a, it's, it's, it's at that meal, that evening time meal, probably more than any other, that we feel the most at home. And there's a, there's a, a rest, there's a pleasure, there's a warmness of heart, there's, there's laughter. Uh, when we get together with other people, do we get together for breakfast? Not really. Do we get together for lunch? Sometimes. When is the most time where we say, hey, let's go out and get something to eat? When is it going to be? In the evening. When everybody's off of work and we'll get together and we'll sit around and, and 
I don't know about you, but I remember times when I was, uh, my wife can sit and I, we sit there and talk and say, hey, do you remember when we went out and ate with them? Do you remember when we went out and ate with them? Do you remember when we went out and ate with them? I couldn't tell you where we ate. I might tell you the restaurant. I surely could tell you what I ate unless it was either really, really good or really, really, really bad. But what we remember is we sat down with them. What we remember is the laughing. What we remember is the stories. What we remember is the friendship of the moment. And it's at these great feasts that no matter what else is going wrong in our life, we feel at home. We will try to recapture that warm feeling we had at that moment. And for some of us, we spend our life trying to recapture one moment. The feast of the Bible that Jesus was speaking about means that God will one day bring us all home. That's what the feast is. The feast is my lost children have come home. Who are we? We're God's lost children. Is this world our home? No, it is not. We're sitting out here in swine fields. And we realize there's something better. There's a better way for my life. And I come and I kneel down before my father. Hello, somebody. I kneel down before my father and I say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against who? You. I'm not worthy. And what does God do? He says, okay, that's fine. Hey, bring my son, bring my daughter a robe of righteousness of salvation. Put upon them the ring of sonship and daughtership. Go out and kill the fatted calf of the spirit and fill them with my presence. Because my son, my daughter that was lost has come home. Jesus says in Matthew 8, 11, he says, many will come from the east and the west and take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. How do you know if Jesus said it, it's going to happen? Can you imagine sitting at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Whew. Can you imagine sitting at a dinner table with the legends of our faith right there? Looking around that table, amazed at who's there and disappointed at who's not there. And looking around at some people eyeballing us saying, I'm amazed you're here. <laughs> Think about it. What a day that will be. That's, and I guess maybe it's because when I get older, when I was my son's age, these teenagers' ages, that stuff didn't mean anything to me. The older I get, the more nostalgic I get. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I'm beginning to hunger for something that's not here because I've lived and I've realized in 44 years this world is not my home. What I'm looking for, what I'm wanting to recapture might actually be something I've never had. Mm. Because of our true older brother in Jesus Christ, the one who did give up everything to come find us, he didn't get mad when we came home. He left everything to come find us and bring us home to the Father. Because of that true brother, God will someday make this world home again. He's going to wipe away death and suffering and tears and give us bodies that run and don't grow weary. Hallelujah. Eat bluebell ice cream and not get fat or sick. <laughs> I don't think you can buy a blue bell right now. But when we get there, I don't know if you've read the Chronicles of Narnia by uh, 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 the Chronicles of Narnia by uh, C.S. Lewis. In the very last book, there was a, there's a character in the book called Jewel, Jewel the Unicorn. And in this story, Jewel the Unicorn said at the very end of the Chronicles of Narnia, said this, I've come home at last. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, though I never knew it. To understand the Chronicles of Narnia were written based on the Christian life from cradle to grave and all the experiences. That's what C.S. Lewis was trying to do. Can I tell you, this is us. 
Can you imagine when we finally stand before the presence of God Almighty? We're standing in the home we never knew, but we knew we'd always get. And we show up and we can say, I'll come home at last. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, even though I never knew it. The youngest brother did not expect to be brought back into the family. He did not expect a feast since he had sinned and, and, and totally disgraced the family. But that, that's what he gets. And the older brother, what does he do? He objects to it. He totally objects to, to this prodigal love, this extravagant love. He objects to it. Why? Because the meal signifies acceptance and relationship. It says that he's been restored. And the religious leaders would forbid from us eating with non-believers. The religion of the day, God's religion that said go out and be the light to the world had turned into the religion of come out from among them and be separate. And to eat with someone was to receive them virtually as family. Somebody that's detestable. Remember that original table we had? Remember who was there? You had the drug addict that was infested with AIDS because of poor hygiene with their needles. You had the, the migrant worker that was working in a, in a chicken factory killing chickens. That's, that's dirty, stinky work. You had the abortion doctor. You had the homosexual. You had the, the adulterous person. You had all these different things. The drug dealer. You had all these different things around the table. That's who Jesus says needs to come home to eat. Why? Because he called you to come home and eat too. Where do you fit in at that table? I deserve to sit at that table, not the one where we're clean and pure and holy. None of us deserve to eat there. Why? Because even Jesus said there's none good but one. And that was the father. He didn't even save it for himself. And so the older brother, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they would forbid you to eat with people because it made them family. How could you do that to somebody who has rejected God? Rejected God. What would have happened? What would have happened if back in the day, Madeline Murray O'Hare, I'm talking to a select few here. If Madeline Murray O'Hare, after she got prayer taken out of school, what would have happened had she sat down at dinner with Billy Graham? A second time, and a third time, and a fourth time. One of the strangest relationships I ever saw take place. Uh, Jerry Falwell, Lynch, uh, was it Lynchburg, Virginia? Pastored a huge Baptist church over there. Formed the moral majority. Great time during the 80s. Had the most crazy relationship with a guy named Larry Flint who founded Hustler Magazine. Pornography galore. How on earth could such a righteous man have anything to do with such an unrighteous man? Because both of them need the blood of Jesus Christ, and neither of them deserve it. And I remember one time watching, I saw a picture of them, and you'd think, why, why, why are they hanging out with that person? That's, that's corrupting good character. Or maybe it's because it's what we're meant to do is not to allow our current character to be corrupted, but maybe let our light so shine that others are drawn to that light because we both need to find our way to this table right here. The Pharisaic thought was if you eat with sinners, if you reason, it was reason that if you eat with a sinner, you become a sinner. But what if the meal, what if that particular meal was actually to draw the sinner towards the Savior? What if the meal was actually to bring them home? This is what I'm going to challenge you with in weeks to come. What if the meal we sat down together was a meal with a 
purpose. It wasn't Jerry Falwell and Larry Flint sitting together so they could eat a Big Mac and talk about shop. There ain't nothing about Larry Flynn I'd really want to talk about that he does. Why would you do it? Maybe it wasn't about the hamburger as much as it was about the relationship building. Jesus shattered this practice. We see it in John 15, 2. At the very beginning, the thing that caused all of this to happen at the very beginning says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners, my Bible says, drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. We don't see a meal going on, but apparently one was taking place. The Pharisees tell us one was taking place. Here's a man who receives sinners, and he eats with them. Jesus was totally destroying religiosity. He eats with the notoriously wicked and the marginalized. How can this be? How can he include them in a meal? Doesn't he realize he's becoming one of them? Mm. The last thing is the new communion. The new communion. And this is where the father says, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. Jesus leaves his true home. Philippians chapter 2 says that Jesus left his own home and he wanders around without a home. That's what's crazy. He leaves his throne in heaven and he comes down to earth and he's homeless. Uh, Matthew 8 verse 20 says this. Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And finally, he's crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem. He doesn't even merit a good death. He's, get, he's getting killed outside the city. It's a sign of exile. It's a sign of rejection. You're not being allowed to die uh, uh, amongst your friends or your loved ones. You're taken outside. As a matter of fact, if you study it, you'll realize that the intersection, it was a, it was a place of busyness. It was a crossroads, but it was also a dump. It was a place where the refuse was taken out. It was a place where, where that was very undignified. It was not a seemingly good place. It's like being put to death out by the landfill, out by the septic sewage pump for the city. Why would you be taken out there? It was because Jesus was being a sign of exile and rejection. Hebrews 13 verses 11 and 12 says this, The high priest carries the blood of the animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Fascinating. Jesus experiences the exile that the human race deserves. We deserve to be put outside the gate and what? Killed. That's what we said about the younger son. That's what the older son should have had happen to him because he disrespected his father. Both of these sons should have been taken outside the city gates and killed according to Old Testament law. What happened to Jesus? He was the son that was taken outside the city and killed on your behalf, on my behalf. He took it for me. That's prodigal love. That is a wasteful and extravagant love that I say thank you God for. I don't deserve it. I deserve to be the one that dies outside the gate. But Jesus took that for you and me. Fascinating. He's, he's alienated. He's cast out so that you and I could come home. We could come home. You could have the most wretched sinner in town. I'm not talking about Phyllis, but somebody else. You could have them. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit makes me say that. I love you. I love you. You can have the most wretched sinner in town come in and kneel down at an altar. And everybody celebrates and says, thank you, Jesus. This person, this person doesn't belong in jail. They belong under the jail. And what do we say? Thank you, Jesus. And we honor them coming to Christ. Why? Because Jesus took the dishonor for us. Jesus took the dishonor for us. He went into exile to reach the exile. 
Fascinating. And on the cross, Jesus loses fellowship and communion even with the Father. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, verse 45. My wife could tell you the, the Latin of that, uh, uh, the Aramaic, excuse me, because she sings it in that Via Della Rosa song. She says that I, I, I'm no good at that. You already figured that out. I'm no good at other languages. I barely speak English. But Jesus cries out and he says, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is forsaken and cast out of the family. Why? So you and I can be brought in. He took the sins you have, the shame that you have, he took it. To the point that not even the father could look at him. And my question is this. If the father wasn't looking at Jesus, then who was he looking at? He was looking at you. Because at that point, at that point we were covered in our sins. Humanity was covered in their sins. And for the first time, come on somebody. It wasn't a masking of blood of goats and bulls and pigeons that was covering the eyes of God so he didn't see mankind's sin. Finally, sin was taking off of mankind. It was placed on his son. And for a moment, the father could not look at the son. Why? Because he was too busy looking at you for the first time. Somebody needs to get hold of that. Somebody needs to understand just how incredible our Savior is. How much the Father loves us. He was forsaken. He was cast out so that we could be brought in. Let's bring this to a close. What we call the Lord's Supper, <clears throat> what we call communion, is a foretaste of the great feast at the end of time known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. That thing that we've read about. That thing we talk about. That thing we celebrate and say that marriage supper is going to come. And we're all going to sit down at the table. And it's going to be wonderful because there's going to be catfish on the table because God's redeemed it. Hallelujah. It's no longer unclean. But there's not going to be a single green bean casserole. Hallelujah. Because it's still unclean even in the house of God. Thank you, Jesus. I felt spiritual saying it. It's a foretaste of this great dinner. We talk about it saying, won't it be wonderful? We'll get to see grandma and grandpa. We'll get to see mama and daddy. We'll get to see all of our loved ones that went before us. We're going to see Peter and Mark and John. And we're going to see all of them, all the saints. We're going to see them all. And the King of kings and the Lord of lords is going to be at the head table. And guess who's sitting next to him? He says we sit on the throne with him. And can I tell you, we think about this great meal. That's going to come. Every time we take communion, it's to remind you in that little old bitty cup of styrofoam bread and rancid grape juice is to remind you, don't get content here. I could not make a meal on those little old pieces of paper in that thing and that horrible grape juice. It's because I never was supposed to make a meal out of it. This world was never supposed to be my home. I was never supposed to be so wondered and, and, and thankful and awed about this life. This life is nothing. This life is, is wretched, even at its very best. This life is wretched compared to what lies ahead. And we are constantly taking communion simply because it's to say, get your eyes off of this. Don't be surprised when this is terrible. It's supposed to be terrible. Even in its beauty, it's terrible. If my righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord, then this world pales in comparison to the world that is yet to come. A home that I know I'm made for, but I've never yet got to see. I know it's coming. We sit at the communion table. You don't have to be perfect, just repent it. You don't have to be assemblies of God because heaven is not about the assemblies of God. Regardless of what they think at 1445 Boonville Avenue in Springfield, Missouri. 
It's not about the Assemblies of God any more than it was about Southern Baptists or Missionary Baptists or Methodist or Episcopalian or Lutheran or the Independents. It doesn't matter about that stuff. What matters is that we get to go home to a father. And what matters is that when we partake, we're not perfect, we're repentant. And when we're repentant, we're authentic. Not perfect, authentic. Because I am a sinner being saved by grace. And so anybody could come. And anybody does come. And everybody should come for that moment. Any repentant sinner could come and be a brother or a sister because of the death and resurrection of the true elder brother who left it all, who didn't say, well, the rest of all of this is mine and the rest of all my father's wealth is mine and now all the other inheritance is mine and I'm not going to spend any of it. I'm not going to share any of it with that prodigal lover of prostitutes. I'm not going to share any of it with those horrible people out there. But instead, Jesus Christ looked at you from a distance. He held all of his worth and value and money in one hand, the inheritance of the Father, and looked at you and said, Dad, I got to go. I don't care about this. I care about them. It's worth it, Father, for me to leave it all behind and go and get them so I can bring my brother I can bring my sister where? Home. 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 That place we're supposed to be. I miss Brother Rick. I miss that man. There's very few people whose death has affected me as much as that man passing away. But I'll tell you this. I wouldn't bring him back for all the tea in China, for all the gold in Fort Knox. I wouldn't bring that man back for nothing. Why? He's home. He's where we want to be. And one day we're going to be. This world's not my home. And all that stuff that tries to ring out and try to get our attention. Friend, let me tell you something. That stuff is rubbish. It's trash. Because this is not our home. I want to be extravagant in my love for the Father as He was for me. I want to be as prodigal with my love for the Father as He was for me. As David began to dance, basically in his long johns, in his underwear, he began to dance and his wife spurned him in her heart because she said, you've made a mockery and a fool of yourself. Oh, look at how the king has behaved. And what did he do? He said, I will make more of myself a fool yet. I will become even more undignified than this. Why? Because I'm finding love in the presence of my father. I am showing an extravagant prodigal love for the prodigal love that was given to me that I did not deserve. And so I give it back to him because he does deserve it. I do not want to be one that sits around and just says, Lord, you should be content with what little I give you. When if we truly understood what God has given to us, we would act like fools every day to show the Father how much we love Him. The death and resurrection of the Son, the love of the Father, create a new community of men and women. A community who regularly break bread together and celebrate the new life and the communion love, that common love that they have for Jesus and through Jesus. Regardless of what some say, it is not enough to just have an individual, personal relationship with God through Christ. It is not enough to have an individual. I want you to hear this. It is not enough to have an individual, personal relationship with God through Christ. Biblical Christianity was never meant to be an individual's religion. It's a religion of community. It's a religion of relationship. 
Yes, there's personal study. There's private prayer. You can even get some stuff off of TV if you can. But can I tell you, it will never replace the church. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5. And it says, Christ died for who? He died for me. No. It said that Christ gave his life for the church. Why? So that we can find our place into it. So we can become a part of it. It's not that we are individuals. It's for that we are all a part of the bride of Christ, the greater body of God. We are called to that. Christianity was never intended to replace. Christianity alone by ourselves was not intended to replace the assembling together. You have to become an active part of the feast. You have to become an active part of the new community. And I know I'm talking to those that showed up on a Sunday night. Thank you. You're doing it. Did you hear me? You're doing it. We are a part of the family of God. I want you to turn with me to page 115 and we'll, we'll end with this. 115. Bottom of the page, it says this. At the end of the story of the prodigal sons, there's a feast of homecoming. So too, at the end of the book of Revelation, at the end of history, there's a feast called the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelations 19. The Lamb is Jesus who was sacrificed for the sins of the world so that we could be pardoned and brought home. This feast happens in the New Jerusalem, the city of God that comes down out of heaven to fill the earth, according to Revelations 21, 22. We are told that the very presence of God is in the city, and so is remarkably the tree of life. That tree whose leaves now affect the healing of the nations, Revelations 22, verse 2. The tree of life, of course, was in the Garden of Eden. And at the end of history, the whole of earth has become the Garden of God again. Somebody see that. The earth becomes the Garden of God again. Death and decay and suffering are gone. The nations are no longer at war. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Revelations 21.4. Jesus, unlike the founder of any other major faith, holds out hope for ordinary human life. Our future is not an ethereal, impersonal form of consciousness. We will not float through the air, but rather we will eat. Hallelujah. We will embrace. We will sing. We will laugh. And we will dance in the kingdom of God in degrees of power and glory and joy that we cannot imagine that is not present in this world. Jesus will make the world our perfect home again. We will no longer be living east of Eden, always wondering, yet never arriving. We will come, and the Father will meet us, and he will embrace us, and we will be brought together into a great feast. Hallelujah. Somebody bow your heads with me right now. Just raise a hand to God and give him some glory right now. And Father, I thank you. I thank you. I get to come home. I get to come home. That day is coming. It is guaranteed. It's going to happen. That day is coming and this prodigal will come home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My Jesus. My Jesus. I love you. I just love you. Now, Father, there's nothing I can do to merit your love. There's nothing I can do to lose your love. You don't love me less when I misbehave no more than you love me more when I do right. You just love me. You love us. And I thank you for that love that does not waver. It does not shake. It does not grow hot or cold. That love is a constant in my life. And I thank you for that because my love is not. Father, I pray right now that you would forgive me me. Come on, somebody. You need to start praying right now. Father, forgive me because I am not worthy. There's nothing in my life that is worthy of what you do. There's nothing in my life that is worthy of coming to the table one day. There's nothing about me, Lord God, that deserves a chance that I'll get. Nothing. Forgive me, God. 
I am that younger brother. I have sinned against you in heaven. And I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. Yet at the same time, I'm the older brother who fails to realize he's just as lost as the brother who left. Because I am religious at times. I'm religious, Lord. I'm religious, but I'm not saved. I'm religious, but I have no love in my heart for the Father. Because I have my own agenda. I have my own things I want to see. I want to have my own things done. I want to come to church and I want to get what I'm going to get. And I'm going to have what I'm going to have. Because I want church my way. I want things my way. I want life my way. That's how come when I pray, I don't ask you what you want, God. I tell you what I want. God, forgive me. Forgive me for that. How arrogant. How absolutely arrogant for me, for us to say that, Lord God. Forgive us when we spend more time telling you what we want instead of spending that time with you, enjoying your love and your presence. My God, I pray right now, fit us for heaven. Search this place, Lord God. Those that are here, those that are watching by video, Father God, I pray right now that you would search us. Search us, Father. And make us ready to go home. Ready to be welcomed home. I do not, I repeat, I do not want to stand before you, Lord, and hear you say, depart from me. You are not welcome here because you weren't ready. You didn't make things right. You didn't serve me. God, I don't want to hear that. Lord, above anything else, I pray right now, make us ready for heaven. Let everything else be frosting on the cake. But this has got to be established. Let us not miss heaven. Come on, somebody praying with me right now. Don't let me miss heaven. I want you. Hell is going to be filled with a lot of religious people who went to church but didn't go to God. Father, I pray right now, forgive us. Father, make us ready. And Lord, I'm praying right now that, Father, as we live life, as we go through our stuff, as we live our days, God, let us not get enamored with this world. Let us not get more excited about what comes on on Tuesday night on television than we are the very God who made the week. Let us not get so excited about the stuff of this earth that we forget there's, there's a heaven that's greater Let us never get so tired that we don't want to come to church. When you said in your word, if you labor and are heavy laden with things in life, come to me and I'll give you rest. I'm not going to get rest just because I go to the lake. I get rest because I go to the Father. Father, I pray right now, change our focus, change our eyes to where we see a new home. We see a home that we were made for. We see something that was divinely imparted for us. My God, do it. Do it. Is there anybody else besides this young man that needs to lay down some stuff at the altar? Come on, you got some stuff in your life you need to lay down. You got some cares in life you need to lay down. You got some burdens in life you need to lay down. I'm telling you, the altar's open right now. Do you need to come? Do you need to lay it down? This is what the altar was made for. This is what the altar was made for. Jesus.
Jesus, move. Jesus, move. Jesus, move. Jesus, move. Jesus, move. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
whispering in his ear every day, man, it's going to be all right. My son, it's going to be all right. I got you. I've never let anybody down before. I'm sure not going to let you down. I got you. And Lord, I pray every day that you put this man's ear. You every day say, I got you. Come on, somebody, press in. Come on, press in. This is what we talk about, where we don't care about the hour, we don't care about the moment. What we care about is being in His presence. We care about being in His presence, in love with Him, hungry for Him. feeling like something the Lord is stirring in me. While those are praying, keep praying. There's something that the Lord is stirring in me. The Bible says that Satan will specialize in the wearing out of the saints. He seeks to wear us out. He seeks to make our love grow cold. He seeks to make that fire not so passionate for spiritual things. The Lord's laying on my heart that there's some fires that need to be stoked up tonight. Are you here? Are you here and you need your fire burning again? Are you here tonight and you'd say, I'm, I'm tired. I haven't let my fire stay burning. I have not let my passion be white hot. Come on, either you're there, you're going to be there, or you're just getting out of there one or the other. This is something we all go through. But I'm telling you, the Lord's stopping everything because he wants to cause a little fire to burn again in somebody's life. Are you here today and you need that fire of Pentecost a little hotter? You need it. You need it blazing again. I want you to step out right now and come to the front. We're going to anoint you with oil. We're going to pray for you. And we're going to see the power of God come all over you again. Come on, are you here? Thank you. Thank you. Is there somebody else? I'm needing a little more power. I'm needing a little more fire. I've grown a little cold. I've grown a little cold. Listen, church, it happens. 
it happens. But the worst thing we can do is stay cold. What we need to do is burn for Jesus Christ. To burn. Come on. Are you with me? You need more. You need more. Come on, step out. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit's going to do something. The Holy Spirit's going to do something. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, I need some people that know how to pray. Come on, I'm needing you right now. I mean, you step out from your chairs and I need you to come stand behind these. They're ready. They're wanting. You're up here at the front. You're wanting more of God. You're wanting that passion renewed. I want you right now just to make things right. Make any confession you need to make. God already knows. Get it all out and say, God, I want you. God, I want you. God, I want you. Come on. Hallelujah. That could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're a living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweet.
my wife to come here if she would. I want you to do one more thing with us, church. I don't know about you, but I'm having some church tonight. I'm enjoying this. And I'm about to get to eat some ice cream later. Hallelujah. I want to ask you to do something with us, church. We pray for you. We anoint you. Come pray for us. Come pray for us. The church is only as strong as it's really its pastors. Be our strength right now with us.